China's real estate industry is collapsing in slow motion. These ghost cities, or residential buildings without tenants or construction that never finished, have become visual metaphors for the ongoing crisis. That kind of really undermined the confidence among home buyers because they were now worried that developers might not deliver the apartment that they had put a down payment uh, on for. And, and so you then got essentially a confidence crisis among consumers who weren't able to trust developers to deliver the department they had paid for, at least in part. And uh, so demand disappeared there was lack of trust among buyers and it's ultimately what led to decline in demand and therefore the downward adjustment of prices as well. One of the issues for the property sector has been its rapid expansion and in China's financial world there have been, been as many regulatory constraints as you might have seen in other parts of the world that are more developed. The total value of commercial real estate sales from things like offices and shopping centers skyrocketed in February 2021 with a month-over-month -month increase of 133%. That same value on those sales has now fallen negative to minus 1.5% from July to August of this year. Part of the problem this summer in late July and early August was that the pace of the sales decline was accelerating while you had Country Garden run into these default worries. From Evergrande's default and eventual bankruptcy filing to Country Garden's debt restructuring, ripple effects are making waves throughout the entire economy and the Chinese stock market. The Hang Seng Mainland Properties Index illustrates this tough time rather clearly, a steep decline since the sector's peak in January 2020. This all comes as China's overall economy struggles with its post-COVID recovery. Wall Street analysts are now cutting their forecasts for China. Barclays, for example, cut its estimate for China's 2023 GDP from an astronomical 9% to 4.5%. Official Chinese statistics state the real estate sector only accounts for 6 to 7% of the country's overall GDP, but estimates from economists like Ken Rogoff suggest all real estate inputs and supply chains make up a whopping 30% of China's overall GDP. So what's going on? with China's housing sector, and does it mean trouble for the U.S. and the global economy? Back in 2014, the country's sizzling housing market began to cool, with fewer sales, falling prices, and slowing development. Compared with the situations back in 2014, the situation is quite different because back in 2014, we don't have these kind of issues of developers. Back at that time, we just have a slowdown, not a huge way of default of private developers, and we don't have a huge group of austerity uh, households which already have a high leverage lower income expectation. This time around, developers began to look to offshore, international debt markets, and local governments to finance new projects anticipating continued growth. They really saw a huge growth in the last two decades, and part of that was because they could buy the land from local governments and then sell those properties that they built on the land to people in, in China, and there was a lot of financing involved with that. As these companies began to grow and grow with no constriction in sight, that's when several Several auditors parted ways with the big real estate companies in China, sparking fears of underlying concerns. It's a result of very deliberate policy by the government to prick the property bubble that was forming over the last decade or so. So the government stepped in and essentially curbed financing to developers, tightened the screw on household borrowing, for example, in order to rein in property prices. But in some sense, they got a bit more than they bargained for because now we are here about a year and a half later and the property market market is actually quite depressed. Evergrande is one of the notable property developers that defaulted on its offshore debt payments in late 2021, meaning it failed to repay bills and even missed the grace period window to repay. Country Garden was another of the privately owned Chinese property developers to catch investors' attention after signaling pressure on their ability to pay down debt. On October 18th, the company missed a $15 million payment. The company now rests with $11 billion in offshore bonds and even mentioned it expects to be unable to meet all of its offshore debt obligations. So one strategy the strategy the government adopted in order to rein in the frothy housing market was really to curb the financing access of developers. Developers would borrow money in the market, uh, would then build apartments and sell these to consumers. And uh, so by essentially cutting off developers from funding, or at least restricting their access to funding, developers suddenly realized they don't have enough money to actually complete the projects they're working on. In total, 26 property developers 
Avengers encountered distress events in 2022, according to S&P Global Ratings. S&P Global Ratings counts distress events as those where the developer reportedly restructured or outright failed to pay any of its offshore or domestic obligations. However, these defaults subsided in 2023 as several of these companies were able to push back their maturities to late 2024. China's shrinking real estate sector over, over the coming years really have a huge impact on heavy industry, on the commodity markets globally, because there's going to be less steel demand, there's going to be less cement being used, less glass, for example, that impacts within China, heavy industrial areas that really produce these raw materials. And so that's not something that will grow very fast. And therefore, China, in some sense, has its own rust belt in the Northeast, a term we're familiar with from the US, for example, where as the economy shifted away to different sectors, you left behind with kind of empty factories and uh, kind of declining employment. And China has the equivalent. All of this is spilling over into the global economy. The International Monetary Fund just cut its global growth forecast for 2024 and called out China's real estate crisis as a big reason why. In addition to citing rising inflation and interest rates, the IMF described China's real estate crisis as a major problem facing policymakers going into 2024. The IMF said diminished consumer confidence and investment in China posed a, quote, significant risk for the global economy. Since real estate was one of the biggest parts of China's economy, real estate developers were growing significantly. I mean, it made a lot of investment sense at one point to buy these bonds. But that growth and that reliance on debt obviously proves unsustainable. I mean, it's something that people have warned about on China's economy for decades. And at some point, the government has started to find, think about how they could reduce the level of debt in their system. This led to the central government's decision to institute a three red lines rule for property developers. This rule puts a cap on the ratios of debt to cash, debt to assets, and debt to equity that these companies can hold. From anecdotes that I've heard, this policy was implemented pretty stringently in that everyone was so scared of giving any financing to the real estate developers that they were almost, it sounded like, cut off. This three red lines policy was so steep, it doubled China's default rate to 4.4% in 2021. Then the following year, it doubled again to 8.2%, according to S&P Global Ratings. Um, I think Chinese government will try to let those private developers to negotiate with creditors and to get those things done to try to stabilize it instead of trying to leverage on central government to bail them out. Fast forward to just a couple months ago, the central bank and government officials moved to boost home sales by lowering the minimum down payment for first-time home buyers to 20% and 30% for second-time purchasers. Officials also began encouraging lenders to lower rates on existing mortgages, all in an effort to boost property sales. All these are really aimed at juicing home sales, uh, raising demand for apartments. And uh, on both of these strategies, the government has only been partially successful so far. We're still early days, but we're not really yet seeing a V-shaped recovery in housing demand. It's really been a, a bit of a slog in recent months to get uh, consumer confidence back into the market and stabilize home demand. But there's a key difference between um, private sector developers and state-owned uh, developers. Uh, these private sector developers really funded themselves a little bit more out of the international market. That is, they went to global investors and issued bonds to fund their expansion, whereas the state-led developers really funded themselves more domestically. This exact phenomenon played out in 2021 and 2022 as the privately owned enterprises or developers default amounts surged 35.4 billion, while their state-owned counterparts fell to 190 million in a very rapid difference. It's not to say that state-led developers are entirely off the hook. They too have faced, of course, um, increasing pressures due to declining demand, uh, and they too are uh, facing it, facing a more difficult time to raise funding, although not quite on the par of what private sector developers experience over the past 18 months or so. The amount in offshore defaults for China's property sector soared to a record rate in the last 10 years, from $4 billion in defaults in 2015 to $54 billion in 2022. And the rate at which companies defaulted tripled, according to the S&P Global Ratings. You see that bifurcation in how the property developers are, are doing. Like, for example, again, Evergrande, they were more exposed to the lower tier cities and not as much to the higher tier cities. It's pretty similar to, let's say, the United States. New York's 
property market will almost always hold its value. It might go down, but after the pandemic, it comes back and more expensive than ever. It's just because more people are always going to the large cities for the job opportunities and also the education and healthcare services that they can get in the large cities. Cities and localities in China differ in their policy responses to the struggling property sector. For example, China central authorities announced that city-level governments could decide on their own the eligibility criteria for first-time homebuyers. These kind of policies differ based on where you are in China. As, as of now, only Shanghai is still maintaining its uh, momentum. While for other tier two city or tier tier two or even tier one city, already slow the momentum. So that means that the the effectiveness of this policy is quite different. And maybe it's just it's just not going to be that kind of boom that we booming economy, booming growth that we've seen in the last couple decades. Also, people have expected you know China's growth overall is going to slow, but does that mean it's going to collapse and fall into a deep recession? I think there's a lot of space in between that scenario and what's happening right now. I think no one right now will expect like the property market will immediately stabilize. I think the、um, market have a better understanding of the. That the property market may not stabilize that soon. I think the key question back to when it will start to stabilize or when it will bottom out. I think that's something that people are debating. As I mentioned, like I, I may be a little bit bearish. Like I don't think this situation will will, will stabilize in 2024 due to supply issues. It's important to recognize that there is a longer term challenge here, and that is we essentially have too large a construction sector in China. We have too large a real estate sector because underlying demand for apartments is declining. We have slowing slowing urbanization decline. Declining demographics, that is, population is aging. We've already rebuilt most of the Chinese housing stock to modern standards over the last two decades, and so China going forward doesn't need the amount of construction activity, the the size of these developers, the overall real estate activity, because it's just structurally declining demand. And it's just that there's sometimes we just don't have enough information, which is the scary part in and of itself, and that's been China's problem: this lack of transparency. But with the data we have, you know, some people are pointing to China's past track record on economic policy. It's 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 just more, I think, what we don't know. But there are growing uncertainties.